Welcome to the Living Unconventionally podcast. I'm Brittany Felix, and every Monday I'll be speaking with someone that realized a traditional life with a soul-sucking 9-to-5 job just wasn't for them. They had the courage to go against what society told them they should want, and now they chase their passions all over the world. We'll discuss their unconventional journey and their exciting and sometimes terrifying travels. Every Wednesday we'll continue that conversation by talking about just how they can afford to travel so often and live a life of freedom most people only ever dream of. Every Friday, I'll answer your questions and offer advice and encouragement to help you start living unconventionally. If you allow yourself to be inspired by my amazing guests, one day I may just be featuring you in your world travels. Welcome to episode 86. I apologize for the delay in getting this week's solo episode out to you. If you're not a part of the Living Unconventionally Facebook group, you don't know that my computer ran into some major issues on Thursday when I went to go record this episode. As I started my computer, it did a forced Microsoft update, which then caused it to freeze. And when I restarted it, it came up with a black screen and then said it was attempting repairs. And it was stuck on that screen for like an hour. I called Microsoft. One of their customer service representatives had me restart it in the middle of that. And when he had me do that, it completely wiped my hard drive. So I had to drive 97 miles back into Colorado from where we're at in Utah to drop this off at a Best Buy because even though the Microsoft representative admitted that it was his fault, The only way they were going to fix it was if I drove to the nearest Microsoft store, which was four hours away. So after a whole ordeal of dealing with this, I was on the phone with them for I think like six hours on Thursday and ended up having to make two trips into Colorado on Friday to pick up my laptop because when we dropped it off, they said it was going to be two or three days. We made the hour and a half drive back home. We're home for about an hour and they called and said it was done. (laughs) So we then had to turn right back around and drive back over there and pick it up. But now that it's all over with, I'm thankful I have it back. My hard drive was completely, I mean, I had to get a new one. So my computer is basically like starting from scratch. I have to read out all my programs. Luckily, I keep all my files in Dropbox, which if you don't know what that is, it's amazing. It's essentially kind of just like the cloud. Um, It keeps everything synced through their website and you can have it as an app on your phone or computer so that anything in that Dropbox is accessible from anywhere that you can get to the Dropbox. So I'm going to have a link to that in the show notes just in case you want to check it out. It's amazing. There's lots of free storage with it, and you can also do some paid programs if you want to do it for like your whole business, like I do, which requires just a little bit more storage. But even still, it's only like 10 bucks a month for me, and I have so much storage, it's insane. Beyond that, <laughs> I want to talk to you a little bit this week about what we're doing on our freedom journey and also answer some listener questions from Gwen that she posted in the Facebook group. So to give you a brief update, we are officially in Utah now. We're in Moab. Actually, we're just outside of it. We've been here since I think Tuesday of this week and just now finally got to explore a little bit yesterday because I spent two days dealing with computer issues and we were looking for a free spot to camp which surprisingly, even though there's a crazy amount of BLM land out here, Bureau of Land Management land, you actually can't really hardly park anywhere. Uh, We did get lucky and find a spot that is amazing, gorgeous views of the LaSalle Mountains. We can actually see Arches National Park from our spot. It's free. So I will have that in the write-up for Moab once we leave. But I think we're going to be here through most of next week as well because there is just so much to see in this area. I am so impressed with it so far. And we haven't even been to Arches or Canyonlands, which are the two main things that people come here for. Yesterday, we took a drive on this kind of one random road that we saw on the map that I'm sure most people that come here never even glance at. And we were able to see petroglyphs, so Native American drawings that they said were over 6,000 years old. And we also saw some dinosaur tracks, which, as you know, are millions upon millions of years old. So that was pretty cool and something that most people that come here probably never even know is just a short drive away. So again, I'll have that in the blog post about this as well in case you want to check it out the next time you're in Moab. So next week, I'll have more updates for you since we're going to be checking out the majority of the parks. We went to Dead Horse Point State Park, which 
I am going to have to research that name because it is so unfortunate and there has to be a reason that they decided to go with that. But name aside and being a fairly small state park aside, it's amazing. It's set up really well for you to just drive through it. And there's tons of mountain biking and hiking trails, but the drive is awesome. There's tons of stop off points, especially once you get to the end. I posted a picture that I took from there in the Living Unconventionally Facebook group, and I'll probably post it in the show notes as well. So you can check that out if you want to see if you want to go to Dead Horse Point State Park at one point. Okay, so now on to Gwen's questions. Her post in the Living Unconventionally Facebook group says, Looking for advice and suggestions. I'm working on selling my house and heading out on the road. My job allows me to work from home as long as I have Wi-Fi. I have three dogs that will join me. I'm single and I like it that way. I'm looking for advice on traveling with the dogs and also experiences with campground Wi-Fi services. I will be in the Midwest and make my way out to Northern California and back. Any advice would be appreciated. I'm nervous, of course, but really excited to downsize and travel. And Gwen actually followed it up with another comment because I asked her if it would be okay if I just used her questions in the episode this week, and she said, of course. And her follow-up comment said, My smallest dog is 55 pounds and my largest is 85, and all three are considered bully breed mutts, which I fear will also be problematic with some places. And that is critical to bring up. The reason I mention that is because, unfortunately, it does matter. Now, (laughs) I'm not going to go off on a tangent here about bully breeds or banned breeds. I'm just going to say it's absolutely ridiculous. If you do research, breed bans are insane. They are pointless. They are stupid. They infuriate me. Beyond that, most insurance companies do have banned breed dog lists, and they will not insure those breeds. What that means is a lot of businesses, and we actually found apartment complexes for us for issues, but most businesses, campgrounds included, will not allow any of those banned breed dogs because they will not be covered by their liability insurance if that dog attacks a person or another dog. So that's why they ban these dogs. I personally think it's ridiculous especially considering that smaller breeds are known to be more aggressive. But again, I I digress. We're not going to go down that road right now. But there are a lot of campgrounds that will not allow bully breed dogs or banned breeds. I will say that in our experience in campgrounds, if you keep the dogs inside, if they stay on a leash, if they don't bark, if they're not aggressive and you kind of keep them away from everyone else, We have not seen any issues. Our dogs are not banned breeds. Well, technically, Lorelai is uh, mostly Rottweiler. So, yeah, she would be. But she doesn't really look it. And we know that her mother was Border Collie. So that's what she's officially listed as on documentation. So we are technically fine. But again, we have not seen any issues with it. Now, you could get that one asshole neighbor who has their little precious chihuahua and you know, they are just scared by your 85 pound bully breed dog, even though he may be a gentle giant and they could say something and you could be kicked out of the park. So, I mean, there always is that possibility. But if you call ahead to these places or if you do research online, it should specifically say that certain animals are not allowed if that is their policy. If it doesn't say, it wouldn't hurt to call. But then again, do you really want to draw more attention to yourself? You know, or do you want to maybe kind of see if you can get by with just keeping them inside and, you know, making sure they're on a leash at all times, even if they are gentle giants and just kind of taking your chances. That's really how that has to be played. Unfortunately, that's not how it should be, but that's just the reality of it. I will say that I'm in a Facebook group called Camping and RVing with Pets, and there's 15,000 members in there. So it is an amazing, amazing resource for all things involved with taking your pets on a road trip or camping with you. There's just an incredible amount of information in that group and people can tell you what parks that have allowed them in and things like that. So I'm going to put a link to that group in the show notes so that if you want to travel with your own pets, I highly suggest that you join it and get in there and start asking questions, start looking through all the old questions, use the search feature. Don't just post the same question that's probably been asked 15,000 times already. Use the search feature. Look for what you're looking for. If you can't find the answer you need, then ask the question. That's just kind of common courtesy in most Facebook groups, but a lot of people don't know that that search feature is there and you can look back through all the old posts. 
So on to the other issue of campground Wi-Fi. I'm going to be brutally honest here, Gwen, and anyone else who is interested in this and say it's basically non-existent. They may list it. Do not ever count on it. Ever. Not once. If you get there and you happen to connect online and maybe you can do a couple of things, that is a huge victory. This has been an ongoing battle for anyone who travels full time and doesn't want to spend a ridiculous amount of money on getting internet. I know I looked at a very, very popular solution, which is the Verizon MiFi. You can get the jetpack. It's essentially a mobile hotspot. We ran into some issues because I can't tether from my phone, which is an option if you don't have an unlimited data plan. So you can look at that as well. Just Google, you know, tether computer to phone or internet or something like that. And you'll get a plethora of information there as well. What that is, is essentially you're just, you're connecting the internet on your computer through your phone and you're using your phone's data. That data will go so unbelievably fast. So be careful if you have a very small data plan on your phone. But the Verizon MiFi Jetpack wireless hotspot is a very popular option. It does come with a two-year contract. We were told, I also heard otherwise at times, but when I actually went into the store, I was told it did come with a two-year contract. We were not willing to do that because we weren't sure how long we were going to be on the road. And I basically try to avoid contracts with big companies at all costs. But even with going with that, my plan for what I need to do was going to be like $600 a month, which is absolutely ridiculously insane, and I was not paying it. So what we have done is I got a little bit creative slash rebellious, and I use an app on my phone called PDA Net Plus. Because we have an unlimited data plan through AT&T, I am not technically supposed to be able to tether my laptop to my phone. So I found essentially a backdoor way in to do that that AT&T doesn't know about, unless they just so happen to listen to this podcast. (laughs) And so that's what I'm doing right now. And I use it a very, very, very little amount, though, because A, you have to have good cell service to do it. And B, it does use up a crazy amount of data. And even though we have unlimited in air quotes, because it's actually very limited. Uh, Once we hit a certain amount of data uses each month, they basically make my phone worthless. I mean, it, it won't hardly operate anymore. They'll shut all the data off pretty much. So it's a balancing act of, you know, I, I only hop on there real quick just to do something that I can take care of in a matter of just a couple of minutes and then save all the major heavy stuff for when we go into towns and connect to public Wi-Fi, which is pretty much what we have to do. Anything I can do on my phone with cell service, I do because we do have the unlimited data, but that's very limited. I mean, I can basically just keep up with social media and I can't even schedule posts out because I use a different website for that. Um, Which, by the way, if you're interested, I use Buffer, B-U-F-F-E-R. I'll have a link to that in the show notes as well. It lets me schedule all my social media posts with the exception of Instagram for however far out that I really want to. So I do about two or three weeks at a time once I get onto Wi-Fi. So there's all these little tips and tricks that you can do to take advantage of the Wi-Fi when you have it, but for the most part, getting it, you cannot rely on campgrounds. So we go into town. We're going to be doing that as soon as I finish editing this episode today and catching up on some things that we've missed since I went into town last week. I generally only go into town about once a week to do Wi-Fi. I do spend several hours there that day, though. But one day a week of major work is a lot better than five days spending eight hours in front of a computer each day when I had a normal job. So I'll accept this trade-off. Now, as far as connecting to public Wi-Fi, what you need to know about that is that it is not a safe and secure connection. It opens you up to viruses, to people being able to access your computer and get all of your information. So if you're going to go on public Wi-Fi, make sure you have all the protection you possibly can. So antivirus, firewalls, all that stuff that will help you avoid those websites that are likely to cause an issue for you. Again, that's just another trade-off that if you want to live this lifestyle, you kind of have to be okay with. Now, I don't know how often that actually happens. I tend to think it's probably not a crazy amount, but it is technically possible. I generally try to find a Starbucks if I can because their Wi-Fi is usually the best Not always, though. Again, sometimes you have to get creative. We had to do that when we were in Woodland Park, Colorado. There was a Starbucks in this small town, 
And so I thought, awesome, yes, Starbucks, we're going to go there, going to have super fast Wi-Fi, it's going to be great. Well, I get there, and apparently everyone else thought the same thing as well. So it was jam-packed of people all trying to use the Wi-Fi at once, which seriously bogs down the system and makes it so incredibly slow. So I looked up what else was in the area nearby, and I saw that there was another Starbucks inside a grocery store. So I went to that one instead, and the Wi-Fi was much faster because I was the only person there using it. So you kind of have to get creative a little bit. I know McDonald's generally has Wi-Fi. I haven't had to use it yet. From what I hear, it's not the best, but it'll do in a pinch. It really just depends on what you're doing. If you're doing a lot of uploading or downloading or streaming, that's going to take quite a while. Be prepared to probably spend a few hours there. But if it's just basic email, maybe maintaining a website, things like that, probably not going to be quite as much of an issue. Now, somebody that goes into this so much more in depth than me, they've been on the road for, I don't even know how long, at least a decade. And their entire focus of their business is about being able to stay connected while on the road is a couple called Technomadia. And literally everything they discuss is all about these issues right here. Being able to stay connected. So internet, phones, keeping your business going, all of it on the road. So I'm going to have a link to them in the show notes as well. They're amazing. Check them out. So Gwen, I hope maybe I've answered your questions. If you want more information, if you want to talk to me about it in more detail, absolutely just follow up in the Living Unconventionally Facebook group. And that goes the same for anyone else who's interested in these issues as well. Anyone else who has questions about making this lifestyle work for you, just email me. I do have a contact me page on my website. Or better yet, because I absolutely hate email, just go to the Living Unconventionally Facebook group, join it, leave me a comment on there. I'm in that group just about every single day as long as I have cell service. And I love connecting with everybody. I love seeing the pictures that you guys are sharing and the stories and the suggestions that you guys have been giving me on places to go visit have been amazing so far. I have gotten so many suggestions for Moab and Utah, and it's awesome. I can't wait to check them all out. So if you're not in the group already, please make sure that you join us. It's so much fun. The people in it are amazing. They all completely understand the desire to live this lifestyle of freedom. So you're going to fit right in. And we would love to have you in there so that we could just make a new friend. So all you have to do to join is simply search for Living Unconventionally on Facebook or click the link that'll be in the show notes for this episode. You can find those show notes very easily by just going to livinguncontentionally.com forward slash episode 086. Those are the numbers 086. And before I leave you today, I want to also mention that another listener, Rebecca, has her own podcast, which I've been a guest on before. It's called My Rescue Rocks. She interviewed me quite a while ago. And Rebecca was actually a guest on this show as well. I'll have a link to both of those episodes if you want to check them out. Rebecca talked about uh, the time that she spent six weeks in Guatemala, which was amazing and makes me want to go so badly. But what I want to mention today is that Rebecca has actually asked me to co-host a few episodes of her podcast with her because animal rescue is something that is very important to me, hence why I got fired up earlier talking about the breed bands. (laughs) And two of those episodes have actually been released now, so I'm going to have links to those in the show notes as well. And if you're remotely interested in rescue work, make sure that you check them out. The first one that I co-hosted with her uh, was all about how to de-stress and overcome compassion fatigue, which if you're involved in animal rescue, you absolutely understand what that means. Heck, even if you just like a few rescues or anything on Facebook, I'm sure everybody sees these posts constantly about animals that have been abused or neglected or set on fire or beaten or any of these horrible, horrible things. And it just gets so difficult to constantly see these stories come across your page. This episode is all about how her listeners have found ways to handle that. And the episode that was just released recently that I co-hosted with her was all about lessons that our rescue pets have taught us. So again, if you have pets, if you're interested in rescues, check out those episodes. We'll have links to that in the show notes as well. So you have a lot of stuff to check out in those show notes this week. And just thank you so much for being here and for being patient and understanding when I have these technical issues that are so infuriating, but are just a part of life and especially uh, life on the road. I hope you've had a fantastic weekend and make sure that you come back on Monday where I'm going to talk to Amy Scott of Nomadtopia Radio.